Welcome to life unrestricted. This is your show if you're sick of living a life controlled by food and exercise rules and if you're ready to learn how to accept yourself and enjoy the heck out of life. My gig is about body image, femininity, self-worth and resilience. Come on, let's walk side by side as we slowly step out of restriction misery and unlock our true selves. Your host, Merit Boxler, is a former national radio DJ, freelance journalist, speaker, and writer with a passion to make women feel good in their bodies. This is a show brought to you live from Switzerland. Hey, lovely family. It's Merit with another love attack on your ears. And I want to start off with a thank you. To those of you who have made the step to actively help me keep this podcast up and running by becoming a so-called Patreon, meaning by making small repeat donations on my page on patreon.com, this uh, support platform I mentioned before. And you know, since I'm not selling anything and podcasts are free for everybody, my podcasting mission has turned out to be very expensive and I honestly would never have thought that this work eats so much time and money to make. Yet make no mistake, I love doing it. It's just the fact that I invest at least 20 hours a week into the whole process of podcasting which includes preparation, writing to people, scheduling, interviewing, reading material, diving to people's work and, you know, actually interviewing them. And then, and that's a massive one, editing and producing and distributing. <laughs> so I cannot express my gratitude enough to tell you how much your help really matters in this case. So huge shout out to Zoe, Rudy, Vanessa, and Deborah for showing your love in that way. And if any one of you listening would like to support me as well, please look into it on patreon.com slash life unrestricted. That's where you can make those small donations. So that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash life unrestricted. I'd really love for you to become a Patreon, but don't worry. I love you anyway. <laughs> And since I bring you the best stuff for your money, let's dive right into today's episode in which I have the pleasure to chat with an incredible woman. And really, I would describe her as personified fierceness, quite frankly. So Life Unrestricted brings you the wonderful Sonia Renee Taylor from California. Sonia Renee is the founder and, as she calls it, radical executive officer of The Body is Not an Apology. This is an international movement and an organization committed to radical self-love and body empowerment as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. Sonia holds a BA in sociology and a master's degree in organizational management. Her work as an award-winning performance poet, activist, and transformational leader continues to have global reach. Sonia is a former national and international poetry slam champion, author, educator, and activist who has mesmerized audiences across the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Germany even, England and Scotland, Sweden, and the Netherlands. So. Really, Sonia, you need to come to Switzerland as well. But anyway, she has performed everywhere in schools and prisons and mental health facilities, homeless shelters, universities, festivals. It's incredible. And by using the power of art as a vehicle for social change, Sonia has been widely recognized for her work as a change agent and has literally won heaps of awards and honors. And Bustle magazine has named her one of the 12 women who paved the way for body positivity. That's quite something. Sonia's work has been seen and heard on practically every news outlet in America. So I was beyond happy to have her on. And uh, before we even started talking, she surprised me by asking how my name is pronounced correctly. And really, she had me right there. Oh, that's a good question. No, no one ever asked that. They just say something and you're the first <laughs> to ask. It's merit. 
<laughs> Mira, it's awesome. Hello. So good to have you on the show. I'm glad you could make it. Thank glad. you. Absolutely glad to be here. If you want to, let's start at the beginning and you can have uh, a go and tell us your incredible life story. And um, <laughs> yeah, tell us how you That's grew up. That's a long road. <laughs> That's, I'd love to hear how you grew up and how your relationship to your body evolved. Sure. Well, I can certainly tell you a little bit about how I grew up and where I see some of the intersections. Um, so I'm a military kid. My father was in the Navy. Um, I was born to teenage parents. My mother was 17 when she had me and my dad was 19 and they were 16 and 18 when they had my brother, who's a year, um, a year and some change older than I. And, um, you know, we moved around a lot because my dad was in the Navy. Um, my, both of my parents, I would say were, you know, amazing when they were amazing, but they were also children. They were kids trying to make humans um, mm -hmm. and trying to, <laughs> trying to, you know, be in this very big and challenging world with minimal skills, you know, um, and coming from their own family traumas and those sorts of things. Um, yes. Early on, my mother developed a drug addiction, I guess when I was about six, uh, about seven, maybe. Um, she developed a drug addiction that stuck with her for 20 some odd years. And we moved around a lot, like I said, and lived in a lot of different states. And But I think that what I, in terms of my own journey, and as it relates to my own relationship with my body, I think my mother gave me some really interesting lessons at a very young age. And I don't think she knew she, some of them, I think she knew she was imparting and some of them, I don't know if she did, but one, my mother certainly had your standard run of the mill body issues, um, that women have. But at the same time, she was also very unapologetically her. Mm -hmm. I have a poem called my mother's belly. And it's about remembering my mother when I was nine years old being like, and she had cesarean sections with both my brother and I. My brother uh, was born with disabilities, um, and so she had a C-section delivering him. And then back in those days, they told you if you had a cesarean section for one child, you had to keep having them, which today we know isn't true. But So my mother had scars from her C-section, and she had, um, you know, a, a jiggly belly. And we, my brother and I just, thought it was awesome and so much fun <laughs> yeah and she would let us play with it and I know I think so often about mothers who have such shame about their bodies um, who won't swim with their children because they can't imagine being in a swimsuit and my mother was just always so unapologetic about her body and so she'd unbutton her pants and lay on the couch and let my brother and I jiggle her belly <laughs> and we yeah. loved it it was so much fun and whether I knew it or not, I was absolutely sort of receiving the message that there wasn't anything wrong with this. And that message really stuck with me, you know, even through all the other social messages about body shame and what's okay for a body and what isn't okay for a body. That always stayed. Um, when my father was overseas and my mother was in active addiction, we would often live with my grandmother. And my family is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the States. And this is my paternal grandmother. And my father's side of the family, all of the women um, have dark skin like I have dark skin. They all have big thighs and big butts and big boobs. <laughs> and that is just how we're built, right? That's To be a tailor woman, uh, is that's what it is. And... You know, I absolutely, again, got dual messages, right? Like, I got the message. My grandmother was always on some strange cabbage water diet or, oh, you know, horrible, ridiculous things. But at the same time, we had a dialogue of affirmation in our house. Like, there were always mixed messages. Um, there were messages that, you know, we needed to conform to this sort of norms of society, but there are also messages that our big butts, big thighs, big breasts, and dark skin was okay. And so when I began to really sort of look at bodies and our messages about bodies, 
I always had both seeds in me. And once I was able to distinguish that one of those messages, the message about body shame and about our bodies not being enough was really a function of, you know, social indoctrination and being told that by a society that profits off of our shame, I was able to realize that the other parts of the message, the message about loving my body and loving the way that it shows up was actually the message that, that, was true. That was the radical self-love message. That was the message that actually came from um, the the truest parts of us. Um, and I was able to to feed that and stop feeding the other one. So usually it's the other way around that if there's only a weak message of your body is okay and the whole society tells you otherwise, people usually, and I did as well, we end up in total body loathing and body hate and body disempowerment, sometimes eating disorders, as in my case, or exercise addiction or whatever might be the case. But mm -hmm. I don't hear anything like that had happened in your life. Your relationship to food was more or less okay. You know, it's interesting. I had very much what I would call definitely the social relationship to food, the same sort of messages that most girls get. I I certainly have thrown up before when I was in middle school and high school. Um, it wasn't a regular activity, but it was definitely one that you were like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that, so I'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, there were messages of, um, you know, like it's okay to be um, it's okay to have some meat on your bones, but not too much, which always sort of had you in that dieting so that you don't get too big, but also not getting too thin kind of paradigm that really existed in my family. And also like a very, and not just in my family, but in my community, but also a very sort of my body as object, right? Like my body as a tool to get things, right? Like to get my needs met to me. There was a lot of street harassment and sexual harassment when I was growing up because I was always more developed than my age might allude to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned that my body was currency at a young age. And that I think more than like loathing my body, I learned, I, I learned to objectify my body the way that society objectified my body. Um, And for me, the way that I went from not hearing those social messages or not taking in those social messages and sort of more closely listening into those more radical self-love messages that I got my, from my family was really when um, I began to make the connection between social justice work and the body. When I started looking at how our society is created on oppressions and how those oppressions play out, I began to see the connection between uh, social injustice and the body. And that's what helped me begin to make those distinctions. How did you see all that? Some of us, we take 20, 30, 40 years or forever to even question the whole diet culture and social justice issues because we're just so oppressed that we're just busy trying to, you know, um, look like a certain standard says we should. So we're not empowered enough to even look to even behind the it. whole curtain. And you exactly. seem to have been very aware of what was going on. What made you so aware of, of the whole goings on and the sinister mechanism of diet culture and social injustices, the whole oppression thing? So, I mean, I think these things happened in phases, right? So I think I have to be honest about saying that I was always a nosy child. I was always a child who questioned everything. I was always a child who wanted to know why. Um, and I think that that, and, and a lot of that is absolutely a function of my parenting. While, you know, like, while my mother, again, dealt with her addiction issues, there were some powerful messages that she gave me from a very early age. Um, one of them being um, there's no such thing as can't was a thing that always happened in my family, in our household. We weren't allowed, my brother and I were not allowed to say we couldn't, we can't do something. My mother just said, we don't, that's not a language we use here. Um, uh, I also was always taught that I was allowed to qu ask questions. So my mother would say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And so she taught me that I could ask anything if I was intentional and thoughtful about the way that I critiqued a thing or asked a question, I absolutely was allowed to ask it. Um, and so I sort of grew up 
and then I also think that those qualities merged with you know, sort of having to be an adult at a really early age because of my mm -hmm. circumstances and family, um, having to sort of grow up really soon, but luckily growing up with these two tools that were really powerful uh, in terms of knowing that I could ask questions and challenge things and knowing um, that I could do anything. Those two messages, I think, really laid the foundation um, so that even when difficult many difficult life circumstances came up. I was always a person who was going to ask why. <laughs> uh, and so when I went away to college, you know, and let me be clear. I mean, uh, my life has been equal parts magic, privilege, and trauma, you know? <laughs> like yeah, in, I get you. In many, many ways. And so there are a lot of opportunities. A lot of these awakenings are a function of privilege. I absolutely figured out how to go to college. It cost me a lot of money that I'm still paying for. <laughs> but um, but I do have um, educational privilege in that sense. And so there were things that my professors were teaching me in college about social injustice that at the time I did not know were going to lead me to um, a perspective about bodies um, and the role of bodies in that. I didn't see that then. Um, but all of these building blocks were getting made and put in place. Um, because everybody isn't going to have the unique path that I had that got me to the things that I know today. And so the question is, once you know a thing, what's your responsibility? And for me, that's the reason why the body is not an apology exists is because you're right. It takes people 30, 40 years to come into these awakenings. And what's been so beautiful for about the body is not an apology is that we get to be like, hey, 18 year old I can find on the internet. You don't have to wait until you're 35 and 20 years deep into an eating disorder or, you know, you're 42 and, you know, 30 years deep into um, self hatred and internalized racism before you can begin to unpack these things. And so, for us, the work of the body is not an apology is so important because it interrupts that amount of time that it takes to get the message and, and get out of this system of body shame and um, oppression. Yeah, I want to get into that, of course, because um, some people might not know you have founded The Body is Not an Apology, as you said, in 2011, so five years ago, as a movement and organization focused on radical self-love and body empowerment. And since last year, there's a huge online platform that connects the world around issues of intersectional global um, social injustices and radical self-love. The platform yeah. <laughs> also hosts a digital magazine, which I found amazing. And there are web-based workshops around these topics, as the webinar that I mentioned before, um, which I found extremely helpful. The content on the platform reaches, as I read, over a quarter of a million people weekly with website visitors from, I don't know, 140, I think I read, countries. <laughs> as yeah. a tool for social justice and global change. And the story of how this movement started, I find it amazing. Would you share it with us? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's actually one of my favorite stories to tell. Um, so I am a performance poet by trade for the last 13 years. I made my living as a person who wrote and performed poetry around the world. Um, and I used to be a part of this um, competitive performance poetry event called Poetry Slam. Uh, and it's where poets from all over get together and they compete um, for prizes and money and titles, um, sharing their poetry. And I was in, oh goodness, I think I was in North Carolina. And <clears throat> I was with a teammate. We were competing as a team, as a group. Um, competing at this uh, regional poetry slam. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who um, was afraid that she might have an unintended pregnancy. Uh, and she also had cerebral palsy uh, and, you know, was just really concerned about, about this uh, pr predicament that she thought she might be in. And um, I'm also a former sex health educator and I've, you name it, I've done it. Right. And so consequently mm -hmm. I kind of, I'm good for getting in people's business. And so I asked her what made her decide to have unprotected sex with this person who was just a casual partner. And she told me that she did not, um, that because her dis 
disability made it difficult for her to be sexual, she didn't feel um, worthy. Like she, yeah, she didn't feel entitled to ask him to use a condom, oh, is what she God. said to me. And in that moment, what I said to her out of you know, out of my face is your body is not an apology. Mm -hmm. I had never said those words before that day. Never. Um, but they were absolutely what was just felt clear in that moment. I said, your body is not an apology. It is not something that you offer to someone to say, sorry for my disability. Um, and we cried together and had that moment. She ended up not being pregnant. But I knew that the, I knew that those words were going to become a poem because they just kept ringing inside of me. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would write this poem called The Body Is Not An Apology. Which is and wonderful. I started <laughs> thank you, thank you. And so I started working on the poem and completed it and just started performing and sharing it around the world. When it, well, wherever I was at the time, which I think was mostly just in the States. Uh, and so maybe about six to eight months later, I was sitting at a friend's house in California on her couch. And I had been sitting with a photo in my cell phone, a selfie that I had taken um, while getting ready for a performance. And I really loved the photo. I thought I felt sexy and hot and <laughs> delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was also terrified to share the photo. I felt um, like people would judge me. I felt like people would say, you're fat, you're ugly, you shouldn't have that photo out in the world. Like I wasn't believing what I knew to be true inside myself that I felt beautiful and empowered. Um, and so I was sitting on this couch and a friend of mine posted a photo of a plus size model on my, on my um, Facebook page. And I, I loved this model. I thought she was beautiful. Um, and I started doing a little Googling and I found that she had just been offered a contract as a lingerie model. And the first photo of her was her in a black corset. Mm -hmm. And my photo was also me in a black corset. And I was like, you know what? Someone paid this woman lots of money <laughs> to put her big thighs on the internet <laughs> in this black corset. Yeah. Um, and so, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and share my photo. So that night I shared the photo. I said, in this photo, I am 230 pounds. I have a terrible tattoo on my left thigh and stretch marks. And I feel gorgeous and beautiful in my body. Wonderful. Share a Share a photo where you feel gorgeous and beautiful in your body, too. And the next morning, I woke up and 20 people had tagged me in photos where they felt empowered. Uh, and I was like, that's awesome. You know what? I think we could really stand to have like a little Facebook page where we affirm each other, where we get to feel powerful in our bodies and we get to tell each other that. So I'm going to start a Facebook page. And since I have this um, poem with this title that I love, The Body Is Not An Apology, I'll just call the Facebook page The Body Is Not An Apology. Um, that was February 9th of 2011. And the page went from 30 people to 300 people to 3,000 people to 35,000 people to today, I think, where our social media imprint is, you know, well over 300,000 people across mm -hmm. our platform and our content, like I said, on our digital magazine is um, last month we saw uh, 700,000 visitors. Beautiful. So, yeah, it would just, um, the movement demanded to be something more, you know, the poem, does it, those words demanded to be something more in the world and, um, and so they have been. Yeah, the most uh, the most amazing thing about the body is not an apology is that it's not only about body size or skin color, but really almost everything from mental health to gender, ability, etc. How did that evolve? Um, I always, it, I would say that it didn't evolve so much as that I... I have always lived at the intersection of identities, right? I've never just been fat, never just been a woman. I've never just been black. I've never just been a woman with clinical depression. I've been all of those things, mm -hmm. all of my, you know, my brother who, um, who has always had uh, intellectual and physical disabilities has always also been a black man, has also always been all of the intersections that he lives at. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, Audrey Lord says, um, we can never have a single issue movement because there are no single issue lives. Uh, and I was always clear that 
the body was never just about, you know, whether or not I can fit in these jeans, that the body was about all of the ways that these vessels show up on the planet. And I was always very committed to talking about that, talking about that from race, from gender, from age, from mental health, from disability, size, all of sexual orientation, you name it, because all of those things are about the body. Um, and so I really was committed to assembling a team of people who could represent those conversations, the ones that I, that maybe I didn't know, the ones that, um, the intersections that I don't live at, but that other people do. I wanted there to be a place where all of those conversations could be raised and where we could begin to look at our experience in our bodies through what we call intersectionality, the crossroads where all of our identities meet and and impact the way that we get to live on the planet in our bodies. So I bet the, the site in itself also opened your eyes to certain issues that you maybe weren't aware of even just because so many people came to the page and shared. I am so much smarter having <laughs> having been a part of the unapologetic posse at The Body Is Not An Apology. Every day I learn more about people's individual experiences. I learn more about the experiences of, and it's given me permission to stumble in my learning and to be met with grace. Um, and as long as I show up with humility and understanding that there are things that I just simply don't know and that, that, that my job is to figure out how to learn them and that when people are gracious and kind enough to teach me that my responsibility in honoring that teaching is to be a studious and um, appreciative learner. I get to get the veil pulled back on so many experiences. I, you know, I didn't grow up undocumented, but now I get to have the conversation about what it means to be an undocumented person in the U.S., right? I didn't grow up um, transgender, but all of a sudden I understand in a different way the importance of pronouns and gender nonconformity, all of these issues um, that I would have never known about because they are not my life, right? But what happens is that when we decide that the body in all of its ways deserves to be on the planet, then other people's lives become important to us. And we want to know what's, what we can do to help them live more unapologetically. And it takes someone like you who has this wonderful mixture of being humble enough to learn new stuff and also unapologetic as a role model and as a change agent also. And what I think is the tragic thing about diet culture and the whole weight stigma out there is that it really meets at all the intersections. So you can really make anyone's life double worse by adding weight stigma, which is something that none of us need. You, you know, if someone is already suffering by being oppressed for his disability, his or her skin color, his or her gender identity, and on top of everything else, they get weight shamed, fat shamed, Absolutely. body shamed. I mean, this is terrible, cannot ever lead to health, n neither mental or physical health. So that's what really set me off because I was a victim only at very few intersections, like being a woman is hard and being in a body that is changing up and down and having had bad trauma was hard. But I am not black. I'm not transgendered. I have an able body. And this is, I see the privilege in that. And mm -hmm. that's why it really pushes all my buttons to see that this weight shaming, fat shaming in the world is ever increasing. And I'd, I'd love to have your thoughts on that, too. Absolutely. I think that what, you know, what we look at is that weight stigma and weight bias add, just like you said, um, an extra nuance of um oppression to people's already lived oppressions, right? Like mm -hmm. there's already sexism, there's already racism, there's already. And then what we double down on top of that is additional shame. Um, and not just shame. I think it's really important. Um, shame is really like how we feel about ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Like that thing that we internalize from systems of oppression, what we call that system and structure of oppression out in the world um, that is enacting on us at the body is not an apology. We call that body terrorism. And it is because the truth of the matter is if I go 
to a doctor, like so many people have gone to doctors, and the doctor tells me, this surgery that I need, he will not give me unless I lose 50 pounds and then I die. That is an act of terror. Mm-hmm. It's an act of terror to have to live in a world that will not treat you unless your body conforms to their standards. And they also blame people and for blame their weight you. on top of that. I mean, you, they won't get blamed for their skin color, but they will all get blamed Absolutely. for the weight. Exactly. Which is, like, which is insane. Exactly. So, you know, we're looking at these situations where where weight stigma, particularly when it meets at the intersections of other marginalizations, its outcomes are deadly. Mm-hmm. They're not just inconvenient. They are deadly. Mm-hmm. And to call that thing anything other than an act of terrorizing people based on their bodies is to continue to um, obscure its impact. And we're not interested in obscuring its impact. We want people to really get what's at stake with things like weight stigma and weight bias and fat phobia. And then also there are the ways in which just our lives get so diminished from the function of diet culture. Um, I think about all of the hours that I gave away on a diet, all the hours I gave away, all the money I gave away, particularly as a person running a startup company. I'm like, do you know what I could do with that money I gave Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig? Oh, <laughs> do you know what, and you, know you what didn't, I, yeah, and you didn't mention the the mental energy either. I mean, exactly. I mean, it takes up like eighty five percent of your mental bandwidth all the time, all the time, all the time. And I'm like. You know, imagine how much sooner the body is not an apology might have been birthed Mm. if not for that mental energy going towards figuring out how to shrink myself. When really what we're being asked to is to be our fullest selves, whether that be physically or emotionally or spiritually. There is so much loss, so much intellectual, spiritual, energetic loss that our society is experiencing because we cannot make peace with the body, because we can't make peace with fatness as a simple example of body diversity. Mm -hmm. The idea that everybody should have the same body, when we say it, it sounds absurd, right? Except that we ask people to do it every single day. And, you know, my goal really is just to wake people up to how, how absurd, how not actually natural it is for us to request people to shrink their bodies for our entertainment. And But what I'm also clear about and that we talk about in our webinars at The Body is Not an Apology is that this isn't accidental, that there is a lot of economic and political resource poured into having people hate their bodies, having people hate other people's bodies. It's always good if someone explains this, so go into as much detail as you wish. Absolutely. So when we think about, we talk, I'll give a couple of the things that we talk about in the webinar. Um, advertisers in the U.S. this year are expected to spend, I think the number is somewhere up to $117.3 billion in advertisements, selling you things. So, you know, whether that's uh, a new rug or curtains or diet pills or weight loss surgery, whatever it is that they're advertising for, right? $117.3 billion. The beauty industry alone is expected to make $217 billion in profit this year. Yes. That is, I mean, that's just one industry. Now, mind you, I said the whole industry spends $117 billion to sell us things. So if we didn't buy into the whole beauty concepts we could crash the economy we, in, in an instant right we would we would cause economic devastation across the world if everybody stopped buying beauty products today the amount of money uh, 213 billion dollars is more than the gross domestic product of 133 global nations Right. So that basically what they stand to make and profit in the beauty industry is more than the economic infrastructure of 133 nations. Just like based that, off insecurity of people. Just based off of insecurity, just based off of the message that you are not enough. Um, and then we also see the ways in which that plays out politically. We use a slide from a film called Misrepresentation uh, in our webinar and the slide uses a statistic, it talks about the U.S. government, and it says that only 
four women have been governor in the United States of America, governor of a state. Then I ask people to guess how many men have been governors, right? And the answer in this number is from, you know, like 2010 or 11. So the number is even more disparate today than it was then. But the number of men who have been governors, 2,317. (laughs) So we are looking at political engagement, the people who run the states in the United States of America, 34 women, 2,317 men. And then I ask people to think about now, I want you to continue to shrink that number by adding how many people of color, Mm -hmm. people with disabilities, how many people. So what we're seeing is that the center of power, the center of resource and the center of economic power and economic foundation, that those things are based off of bodies. Certain bodies have access to those and certain bodies do not. And us being consumed with whether or not we Um, way too much or whether or not um, we can be seen without makeup is not accidental. That energy that we talked about, that energy that, you know, that I exhausted while dieting and Mm -hmm. that energy is energy that could be placed into my economic and political power. But it wasn't when I was going to Weight Watchers every week. It wasn't when I was exorbitantly concerned about whether or not people thought I was beautiful or not. There were all of these other external factors that were telling me that I needed to put my attention and energy over here while the entire economic and political machine of the country that I live in was running without me. Mm -hmm. And that's the outcome, you know, like that's the political and economic outcome of body shame and body oppression, um, of body terrorism is that it makes us invisible in the power structures of the places where we live. It makes us be so small that we don't have um, autonomy, right? It's the reason why um, reproductive rights can be eroded, right? Because we are so busy just trying to feel good enough that we don't feel like we're empowered enough to impact political decisions about our bodies. We don't feel powerful enough to believe that we can impact the economic infrastructure of our society. We don't believe we're powerful enough. And that's not by accident. Um, Mm -hmm. And there are specific ways in which this society continues to reinforce the message that we're not powerful enough, which keeps us out of their way. (laughs) And it's very insidious, too, because they made it so that we can hardly ever be aware of it unless someone (laughs) helps waking us up. And unless we are woken up, we keep fighting each other. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We, We don't realize that actually we are experiencing this thing that requires our, you know, our cohesive relationship, that requires us to be in solidarity with one another to fight these larger systems. And we don't realize that. But also part of fighting those larger systems is in being clear, and again, clear and honest with ourselves about where we hold privilege in those systems. You know, where our lack of awareness causes us to be agents of oppression on other people's bodies. Mm -hmm. And that conversation about like being humble and appreciative enough to listen to the experiences of other bodies, that's what gets us there. That's what gets us to say, oh, here is where our oppression overlaps. And here is where I have been an agent of oppression toward your body. And let me listen to how that has impacted you so that I can disengage that, so that I can show up differently in the world in solidarity for our collective liberation. Please make an example so that everyone can really see and understand what this means and what the change would mean. Absolutely. I'm just going to give like a really, a couple of small things that we don't think about, right? Mm -hmm. One of my practices now as as a result of living this work is when I walk in the room, I walk in the room and the first thing that I notice in a room is one, if it's a group of people who isn't in the room, right? Oh, Oh, there aren't in the room. Who is not in the room? Who is not in this space? Oh, there are no trans people in this space. There are no people of color in this space. 
There are no people with disabilities in this space. Could people with disabilities even get in this space? Is there a ramp? Are the doors wide enough? Is there a stage that someone could or could not get off of? Are the chairs big enough? Do the chairs have arms on them so that only certain bodies of certain size can fit in them? These are just the questions that I now ask when I walk into a space because I think about other people's bodies. So there are small ways that you can do that. There are small ways that you can do that. You can say, if I am putting on an event, do I have seating that anybody could fit in? Mm -hmm. Do I have um, a ramp so that someone uh, who uses a wheelchair could get into this space? And if I don't, I have decided that it's not important enough to make it to make space for those bodies. So that they don't even feel it, safe enough to exactly. To come. That means it means something, right? Like it's not just we we minimize the impact of that. Like oh well, you know, we, it's just not there. We didn't, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. But it asks to make a space inaccessible for someone means that you don't care if they get access. That means that you do not value their participation to the same extent that you value the participation of people that you did accommodate, mm -hmm. and. That awareness, that awareness changes the way that we get to show up. Um, another one of the things that I think is so important, if, I ask people this all the time. If you are in a room in 2016 of any decision making, at any space of decision making power, and you are in a room and you look around and it's only white people, something's wrong. And you have to be willing to say that out loud. Yes. Hey, there is something wrong that we are making plans And there are only people who look exactly like me in this space. Which means there's a lot of stuff going very wrong at there's this moment in time. There's a lot of stuff, time. right. And so these questions, I mean, and they're not easy. It's hard. We're taught to be silent about these things. We're taught, don't rock the boat. But again, all of those messages are all part of the message of body oppression, right? Those are all the things that keep us politically and economically disempowered. So we have to be willing to risk a little bit. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable. There is no positive change that happens in the world um, that doesn't require discomfort. It requires discomfort. If you're super comfortable, then nothing's changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're super comfortable, nothing's changing. And so we've got to be willing to get uncomfortable. What do you do? I had this with a friend of mine who is in a larger body and I'm usually talking about body positivity and stuff like that. But she always makes those self-deprecating comments. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm so fat and this and that. And there's nothing when I say no, she doesn't take it. When I try and talk to her about that she is equally beautiful than like, like anyone else is, she doesn't want to hear it. And that mm -hmm. leaves me in a, almost in a despairing mood because I see that she doesn't even want to see that she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. So sometimes we are so deeply, we are so deeply internalized, right? Like with, with the shame and with the oppression, it lives so deeply inside of us that that we can't even figure out how to get out of it. And so one of the things that I do is that I, there's just a rule for me that is that we don't, we don't body shame our own bodies or anybody else's body in my, in my presence. It's a rule. And I don't present it as a thing that I'm doing for you. I present it as a thing that I'm doing for me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I love you. And of course I want you to feel beautiful and powerful in your body. I want you to stop hating your body, but I can't make you stop hating your body. But what I can say is that when you hate your body in your presence, it impacts me. Mm -hmm. It harms me. When you talk that way about yourself, it harms me. And so what I'm asking you to do is to stop doing it in my presence because it's harming me. That's not about you trying to make her get someplace, right? Sometimes our own boundaries invite other people to investigate the way that they're being, you know? And like, as a person who's saying like, I'm, I am absolutely recovering from an eating disorder. And the thinking that you talk about, about your own body, absolutely fueled the way in which my eating disorder grew. And mm -hmm. so for my own personal well-being, I love you so much. I'm going to ask you not to talk that way about yourself when you're around me. And, and, Hopefully that stand that you're taking for your own well-being will be something that she actually can ultimately feel empowered by. Like, wow, I didn't realize because we think 
that our body shame is just ours, right? That it doesn't impact anybody else. That the way that we feel about our bodies has no relationship to the rest of the world. And what the body is not an apology is always telling people is that our shame is contagious. And so is our radical self-love. And so when I practice radical self-love, the kind that says I have boundaries for the way that people are allowed to talk about bodies around me, when I say that, that actually reminds people that they too have the power and capacity um, to care for themselves, to love themselves, and to have boundaries for themselves. Um, And to know that the way that they show up in the world has an impact on someone other than them. And that is an important message for us to give each other. Because you're either participating in your own oppression or you're not. We're either normalizing the body shaming with ourselves or others, or we're, I don't know, helping not to make this as normal as it is. Yeah, we need to change something, and it takes one person at a time to change it and to not have this be a normalized behavior. Yes, absolutely. And we have to be recognizing that we are not, we don't exist in a vacuum, that our individual experiences have social, political, economic impacts on the lives of other people. And so that body shame that we carry around absolutely feeds into the crevices of other people's lives and impacts them. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to know that and to be mindful of it. I had an experience once. I was at a restaurant with my ex-girlfriend. Both of us um, are fat by our own personal definitions. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're out eating. And there was a group of young girls at the table, college age. And one of them was talking about, um, she literally said, I'd kill myself if my kids were fat. Cool. Uh, and like in that moment, I was like, what, what do I do about that? And as they got up to leave, I stopped her and I said, I I just want to take a moment and say, I didn't mean to be, but I was listening to your conversation at your table. And I heard you say that you would kill yourself if your kids were fat. And I just want you to know that as a woman in a fat body, how painful and hurtful that was for me. Um, I said, it didn't feel any differently to me in my body than if I would have heard you say, I'd kill myself if my par- my kids brought home a black person. Mm-hmm. It didn't feel different. It was about how much you hate a body that looks like mine that you would kill yourself. Mm-hmm. And I want you to know that that impacted me. And she was like, I'm so sorry. I never meant it that way. You know, like she, and I was like, I just want you to know that your words have an impact. Right? You never know who's listening and how it's going to, how they're going to experience it. And I want you to know that your words impacted me. Um, and then I was like, and, you know, I do this work called The Body's Not Apology, and I want you to check it out. <laughs> Go oh, yeah. visit us on Facebook. Um, but it was important for, for her to know that her words didn't exist in a vacuum, that they absolutely caused harm to two people that she didn't even, that there is collateral damage. Body oppression creates collateral damage everywhere it goes. And she needed to hear that. Yeah, it transports a very negative energy that we've gotten so used to that we hardly exactly. ever question it. And, and mm-hmm. we need to wake up to this in order to change it. You stress the word radical in radical self-love as opposed yes. to just call it self-love as so many others do. Right now it's a buzzword as it seems. Mm-hmm. So what is the difference? What is radical self-love to you? The best way to describe radical self-love is to talk about the definition of radical. I'm here for self-love. But self-love is, again, in many ways, an individual experience. It is about how you feel about your body, which is important and valuable. The challenge of it is that that value does not um, inherently extend to people beyond you. It doesn't acknowledge that your individual self-esteem actually should transform the way that you live in your body and the way that you engage with other people's bodies. And so for us, really talking about radical self-love is talking about the transformative process of self-love. And so radical self-love, radical is defined as going to the root or origin of a thing, fundamental. It's thoroughgoing or extreme It favors drastic political, economic, and social uh, change. It's the basis or foundation of a thing, and it exists inherently. We believe that self-love is the root 
of who we are, right? That it's fundamental. It is a fundamental way of being. You're saying that we were not born hating ourselves. Is that exactly? Okay. Have you ever seen a self-loathing toddler? No. Have you ever seen a toddler who's like, oh my gosh, I really hate my thighs? Never. No. Yeah, that's what Virgie Tovar said. She said my body image was great until kindergarten. Yes, you have never seen a, a child who is yet to be socialized, right? Who th who thinks that their body is wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's because we come here as love. We come here clear that we are just fine in the bodies that we have and actually enamored with them. We think they're beautiful and fun and squeaky and squishy and cool. And then we get told that that isn't true. And that that's not a function of, of our inherent self, right? That's not the root of us. That's a thing that was given to us. And so we believe that we need an extreme form of self-love to counter this constant barrage of shame, oppression, and body terrorism that happens against bodies, right? Mm -hmm. We've tried a little bit. <laughs> a little bit doesn't get us there. We need something extreme. Um, we believe that the society needs a drastic political, economic, and social uh, reformation in the way that we deal with bodies and body difference. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe that radical self-love is the foundation of radical human love, that we actually are incapable of making peace out in the world until we make peace inside of us. And that radical self-love is our inherent state. It is who we are. And so the word radical really gets to the full scope of what self-love ought to do, which is tra transform us and then transform the world. You know, it became very apparent to me when you started talking about kids, because when I think back, I don't really remember it, but when I think of Virgie Tovar's story of her walking down the hallway, jiggling her body and loving it before everybody made her hate it, I mm -hmm. think if if you are inherently loving what you have, you wouldn't judge any other, and you're just appreciating that wow, what is, what is over there? Show me yours. I'm going to show you mine. Whatever it is, you know, not especially any body parts, but just, wow, you're different. I appreciate your differentness. And we are of the same human material. How amazing is that? And somehow we start to just grow out of that. And then we grow into judgmental, walled up, not radical self-loving people at all right so it's yeah. it's really hard to 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 reverse engineer all the damage it it can be but i find well two things one it, i don't think that it's somehow we stop being that it's intentional we get socialized to stop seeing body difference as something to celebrate we get social we are told that somebody we live in a hierarchy of bodies in the yeah. society and that hierarchy becomes evident to children as soon as they have cognition about the way in which the world operates the, the lack of um, visibility of some bodies right like never seeing a body and then seeing the body is one of the ways in which we tell children that that body is not okay right so if you've never seen a disabled person and then you're five and you see one and you point it out and then your mother says Shh, oh my gosh don't do that right now you have a message that there's something wrong with that body and that you have to be quiet about it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a, the invitation isn't, that's, yes, that is a body that's different than yours. This body uses a chair to get around. Isn't that interesting, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the way we teach that. And so our messages that children get about bodies um, are not accidental. They're intentional. So, so I just wanted to say that part, like we didn't somehow get there. It's very, it's You're very, right. de very by design. The other piece I, I think less of reverse engineering than I do peeling away the layers, right? If, it, if radical self-love is an onion and then in the center of it is radical self-love, right, which is us, it's how we came here, what we've received are layers of body shame and body terrorism on top of our radical self-love. And pulling back the layers um, helps, us, helps us begin to get to that, that core. But part of pulling back the layers is making the distinction between what I call the outside voice and the inside voice. The inside voice is the radical self-love voice. It's the voice that knew that actually the photo that I took, I felt beautiful in. The outside voice is the voice that was telling me, don't share that, you're ugly, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. That was the outside voice. That's the voice of body shame and oppression. And when we are learn to make the distinction between the outside voice and the inside voice. And basically, it's really easy. The inside voice talks to you from a place of love. 
The inside voice is compassionate and loving and kind. And as soon as that is not the voice that's happening, you are not in your inside voice. You are you are not in your radical self-love voice. You are in the body shame, body terrorism voice. You are in the system voice trying to control the way that you feel about your body. And making that distinction helps us start to operate from a place of awareness. Like, oh, that thing I thought, that's not actually my thought. And then we begin to question, right? And then we can start questioning where the message came from. I had a friend, I was recently in Brazil, traveling with an amazing group of uh, feminists from around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there was a young woman with us, you know, by anybody's body standard, she's, you know, thin and svelte and all of these other things. But she was talking about this photo that she didn't like because because she felt like she had a pooch in the in the photo. Um, she was like, oh, no, I can't post that. And I said, who told you your stomach was supposed to be flat? Hmm. And she was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. She realized that it was a message that had come from some ridiculous outside source that had no validity, that couldn't be <laughs> valid. You know, like, it immediately got her to be like, oh, I never asked myself that. Right. We don't ask ourselves where we got these messages that we think. And as soon as we begin to question them, they they don't hold up. They they actually start to crumble pretty quickly. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't spend a lot of our time crumbling the message, a lot of our time interrogating the reasons. Um, but it ma- makes the distinction between what is me walking in radical self-love look like versus me walking in body shame, it makes the distinction much easier. And what did the journey look like for you to get rid of all of your layers of body shame to let them go? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's one of the most important things that we should know about this is that I mean, unless we can figure out how to not live in the world, <laughs> until the world gets rid of body shame, we will always be in it, right? Like there'll always be a, a layer trying to attach itself to me because I live in a world that's going to constantly tell me right now um, that there's something about my body that's not okay. And there will be days when I totally get that as a complete and total lie and tell it to, you know, go jump off a bridge. And then there will be days when it seeps in. And my answer, my res- my response to that message on those days is that I love the Sonya who doesn't like her body. I love her too. And when I love the Sonya that doesn't like her body, I love that Sonya into loving herself again. It really, whatever it is that we are shaming or judging, when I shift my perspective to simply giving whatever that is more love, more love, more grace, more compassion, more kindness. I move through it. And so consequently, there will be days. There are days when I don't like my body. And I run an organization called The Body Is Not An Apology. Mm-hmm. And there are days when I don't like my body. And on those days, I am loving and kind and compassionate to the Sonya who doesn't like her body. And that's okay. Because no state is permanent. You know, it will leave. And so... I call it giving ourselves some grace. The idea that we have to do this journey perfectly, we have to excavate every piece of body shame or else we are terrible, you know, body oppressors. (laughs) Actually, that framework, that framework is actually part of the system of body oppression. The the framework that I have to get it right or else I'm terrible. That's a perfectionism again. Yeah, exactly. But what was the hardest thing for you to get over that you can now say you have successfully mastered? Oh, absolutely. So my biggest, um, I mean, there are a billion of those. <laughs> there are lots of things I've had to get over. And, there, and some, I've had some really powerful transform, transformations around a lot of areas of my life. Um, but the first one, the one that sort of birthed some new ways of being for me, um, was hair shame. I uh, developed traction alopecia in third grade. My mother would braid my hair and she braided it so tightly that um, it damaged the hair follicles on the sides of my head. And I had bald spots when I was in third grade, permanent bald spots. And I got teased unmercifully about it. Um, it was a, 
one of those places where the shame lives at the intersection of right like my femininity and hair and an extra layer of shame um as a black woman and black woman's hair which is which is related to a, lo- a lot of racial and racist scrutiny um and so i grew up feeling very 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 ashamed of my hair and consequently, I bought wigs. I, I did everything you could to hide my hair. I bought weaves. I wore extensions. And then eventually I started wearing wigs. And I wore wigs for about a decade straight um, with people having never actually seen my own hair. Like I had lovers who had never seen my actual hair. And I knew about six months after I started The Body is Not an Apology, I knew that, um, that I was being a hypocrite. I was telling people on Facebook every day to love themselves radically and unapologetically. And then I would put on my wig to go walk my dog or go to the grocery store or whatever it was. Um, It had to be in my wig. And I felt like a liar. I felt like I was not being truthful to, to what it was I was trying to create in the world. And so I knew that I had to do something. Um, And I, the way that I think about things is, all right, what's the scariest thing I could do? And the scariest thing that I could do is be bald, right? Like, because I, my belief was that without hair, I couldn't be beautiful. And because I had these bald spots, I wasn't. Be- so what if I had no hair at all? Like, oh my gosh. And I decided that I was going to try to do the scariest thing for 30 days. Just see what happened. Like, I was going to confront this belief head on and see what happened. And maybe I would head on. Yeah, literally head bald head on. Uh, (laughs) Um, And so I did a thing, uh, what I call the shaving ceremony. I invited 10 of my friends to come to my house and I invited them to cut my hair. And when they cut my hair to speak about what they hoped they would remove from me and then lay their hands on my head and bless my scalp with what they hoped would grow in its place. And then I videotaped myself for the next 30 days being bald in the world, going on dates, going to grocery stores, going to the pool, all of these really interesting just being and being um, from a way that I thought was going to be super scary. How was and, that? Um, hard. It's hard. It was very hard. So I called this project, this 30-day project, the Ruckus Project, R-U-H. C-U-S, it stands for Radically Unapologetic Healing Challenge for Us. It was about raising some ruckus in my life, shaking up um, my body shame. And it was terrifying. Uh, You can watch videos of my ruckus project on YouTube uh, for 30 days. There were days when I was like, oh, this is cool. And then there were days when I was like, I feel like the ugliest person in the world. And I don't know what to do. And letting myself go through that process, letting myself be in all of those different states really made clear to me at the end of that journey that that feeling, one of not feeling beautiful, wasn't actually ever about my hair, that it was about so many other things. Um, And that my hair actually had no bearing on my power in the world and that the world actually just was receiving me um, in the way in which I was receiving myself, that the world was absolutely a reflection of how I felt about myself. And so the days when I felt beautiful, the world reflected to me that I I was beautiful. And the days I felt like shame and ugly, the world would give me things to, um, to give evidence to that because basically I was providing the evidence for whatever I saw what I wanted to see. Is it like and the same the same thing with body image where people find out that it's not really about the body, but something entirely different, that a body shame moment can come up in a second and that before that they were fine and then exactly. they're fine again? And then they're fine again, right? That there, there's, there's, there's things that will come at us, right? And then the choice is whether we hold them or whether we release them. Um, right. And so what happens oftentimes when we're young is that things come at us and then we hold them. We tuck them away inside of ourselves and we decide that that is who we are. Mm-hmm. So when they teased me as a kid, I held that and I decided that that is who I was. And because that is who I was, it stayed with me for 30 years. And then when I decided that it didn't have to be who I was, I began to let it go. And the days that I really let it go, the world met me. And, oh, I really let it go. And the days that I didn't let it go, the world kept giving me evidence that, you know, that I wasn't. 
because I was really believing that. We find evidence to support whatever it is we believe. So when we shift our belief, all of a sudden the evidence shifts as well. That's an amazing discovery when we find out that we are really projecting things out in the world, depending on how our energy is. You know, I think this is an important distinction. It doesn't mean that there are not real barriers and oppressions that the world is giving to us. Absolutely. Those things absolutely exist. The question is, am I choosing to hold them as who I am? Or am I choosing to see them as a thing that is not of me and that I do not have to accept? That's the difference. Not that they don't exist, but that either I can invite them to be a part of my real life or I can reject them and figure out how I move, how I dismantle them, how I burn them down, how I crumble them to the ground, how I fight against them. Um, and that distinction is, determines how we move through the world, either as empowered people or as disempowered people. Yeah. How do you help other people stepping into their own truth and speaking up for themselves without having crippling fear of being rejected? So again, I think it's really about, um, again, making that distinction, right? Like that, that, that fear is not your inherent self. That fear is an external thing that you've been given. And you can give it back. You really can give it back. And then there are small ways that you can practice giving it back that help. Our webinar, 10 Tools to Radical Self-Love, is designed to do exactly that, to give people teeny ways, every real practical ways, like just practical things. Like, oh, why did I buy this Us magazine that's going to tell me I'm stupid and fat? <laughs> why, yeah. why, did I some, why did I pay somebody money? <laughs> to tell me I'm stupid and fat, right? Like, oh, I don't have to do that. And then that's a different way. That's a different way of thinking, which gives us a different way of doing, which gives us a different way of being. And transformation is a thinking, doing, being process. Yeah, right? and a painful process also. And it can abs it's absolutely hard. It is so difficult, but it's so worth it in the end. It is painful. It's the difference between taking the Band-Aid off slow or taking the Band-Aid off fast, right? <laughs> like, yeah. either way it goes, it's going to sting. The question is, do I want the sting that diminishes my life forever? Or do I want the sting that's about to give me an opening to a brand new way of being um, that actually is beautiful and gorgeous and powerful? And once we get that the other side actually is better than where we've been, when we really get that the other side is better than where we've been, then we want to change. And sometimes better just means this side is so horrible that whatever is on the other side has to be better than this. Yeah. Some people just say that it's the horror, you know, that you Versus kind of prefer, you yeah, the yeah. uncertainty. So what would you tell a woman who is doused in body shame and doesn't believe in herself? What would you tell her to just take the first step? Um, register for the 10 Tools to Radical Self-Love webinar. Yes. <laughs> Come yeah. to our website and, and dive in. It's the reason we created this platform, right? That we don't, get, we don't get out of this by ourselves. We need community, we need information, and we need an education. We and do. The Body is Not an Apology is designed to provide all three of those things. Come read articles that are about, see yourself, right? So much of the reason we stay stuck is because we can't see our struggle in other people. And so we think we're alone and we think it's just us. And then we suffer in silence, isolated. The body is not an apology is designed to keep you out of isolation. Come read articles, read things that, that, it, it, you know, that pique your interest and begin to see how other people moved through those dynamics for themselves. And then sign up for a webinar. They're totally free. So take the first step. And I really, you know, the, the reason we've sort of designed it this way, the reason when you log onto the body is not an apology, the first thing you see is our digital magazine is because we want you, we want you to just start Realizing you're not alone by listening to other people's narratives and stories, by following and reading these other things. It's a very um, easy way to dip your toe into these ideas without jumping all the way in, which might feel scary. So spend some time here. Just spend some time reading and getting acclimated to the content. Then sign up for a webinar and like 
you know, just come and see what happens. You have nothing to lose except for body shape. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your message was to somebody who just doesn't feel like they belong or don't fit in, but you just answered that perfectly already. It's just that we can go to your page, thebodiesnotanapology.com, and we will find people who share our story or our struggles, and we don't feel as alone as we might have before. Do well, insecurities absolutely. still show up for you in your life these days? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're much less often. And like I said, I have the ability to distinguish between what they are and who I am, right? Those voices are clearer to me today. So there are moments where I, you know, like I still live in a world that tells you that fatness is bad. And so there are days when I'm like, oh, I'm fat. And then I say, yeah, and? <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> and so my insecurities certainly show up. And when they do, I say, okay, I love you. I love you, Sonia, who doesn't think you're good enough right now. I love you, Sonia, who feels completely alone in the world. I love you. And when I love, love myself in those ways, breakthrough always happens. Every single time, without fail. This is so beautiful. And you're sharing that love. So if you were in charge of the world, what would we see change <laughs> immediately? Oh, I would love it. I mean, I keep saying, I was like, I don't know why people just haven't made me the world leader yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Here's what it is. I don't want to be in charge of the world. I want us to be in charge of the world collectively, that we celebrate with our brilliant ways of being, with our diverse and exceptional bodies. And as soon as we realize when our positions of power really look like we look, really look as diverse and vibrant and um, phenomenally gorgeous as we look, that's when we're going to have the world we want. The world we want actually looks like us, which is different celebrating and vibrant and all the different ways that we show up in our bodies. That's the world that I want. That's the And that's the system that I want to see happen in the planet. If people want to take one step closer to that world, where do they find you? You can always find me at thebodyisnotanapology.com. You should visit all the face, all of the social media places, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter. We're, we're everywhere. If you put in the body is not an apology, we will be there. And we're there with a heaping dose of radical self-love for you. Oh, beautiful. Now it's time for my last question for you. What yeah. would you like to be remembered for? Oh, ah. that I love so hard that I changed the world. Oh, that gave <laughs> me chills. Thank you for giving me chills. My Sonia. pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia Renee, for talking to me. This has been the shortest 75 minutes in my life. <laughs> Thank you so much, Merit, for asking me. I really appreciate um, getting to spend this time with you. Bye-bye. Bye. This was today's dose of badassery from Life Unrestricted. Find the show notes with links to everything we mentioned in this episode over at lifeunrestricted.org. And if this show is making you feel good, awesome, make sure to subscribe and please let others feel good too. By leaving a five-star review on iTunes, you'll help make this show more visible and therefore more accessible for others. You're the best. Thanks. Thanks.